Uh, Sean has a really amazing bio. We're lucky to have him here with us today for the Authors That series. Um, he is a UCLA medical school professor and the founder at the executive director of the UCLA Center for Digital Behavior and the UC Institute for Prediction Technology. He has a PhD in psychology and a master's in health services research from Stanford University. And the work he will present today is on behavior change based on his research with patients and consulting with businesses. He's tackled challenges ranging from getting people to stick with New Year's resolutions, which we all would love to learn more about, I'm sure, to uh, keeping healthier and addressing some of the most important would-be problems like preventing the spread of HIV. His book, Stick With It, uh, is available from Harper as of June 20th. Thank you for being here. Thanks so much, Jessica. I wrote this book because on a daily basis, I was hearing stories from people who were having trouble sticking with things that they wanted to do. For those of you who've, who've ever tried to do something and, and had a difficult time sticking with things, it can be really, really tough. You know, if you've tried doing something and you fail at it and you really want to do it, people can really suffer whether we're trying to do it for ourselves, to get ourselves to stick with things, or we're trying to get other people who we really care about to stick with things that they want to do or that are good for them. So, so in hearing these stories, I'd really empathize with people. And, and at the same time, you know, half the time I'd be empathizing with them, and half the time I'd be really frustrated hearing their answers because their, their reasoning behind why they couldn't stick with things or why other people couldn't stick with things were often because someone wasn't dedicated enough. They were lazy. They, there were problems with the individual. They weren't motivated enough. And you know, this not only makes us feel bad about ourselves or about people to pin that on the individual, but it's actually not the correct Science, it's not backed by science. So what I had learned is that the reason why we don't stick with things is not because of a problem with the person, not, not because of a problem with ourselves or other people, it's because we're not following the right process. So in this talk, I'm gonna talk about that process and, and that's what led me to write this book. And this same process can be used for you know, small, mundane things, just like getting ourselves to stick with a hobby that we want to take on. But it can also be used for really serious, important things, like getting ourselves or others to stick with medication that's been prescribed, or getting ourselves or others to stay free from diseases. So that's why I wrote this book. Now, as a social and behavioral psychologist, I love that I get to, to meet and help so many different types of people. I get to meet with entrepreneurs, with public health experts, with engineers, and our own research participants. And on the way over here, for example, on the flight over, I, I got in a conversation with the person in the seat next to me, and he, he reminds me of my uncle Sid from New York. He has this strong New York accent. And, and so he says to me, Dr. Young, every month I pay for my gym membership. I, I try to do something good for myself. I know I should go to the gym, but I don't go to the gym. Why don't I go? I'm paying for my gym membership. Can you give me some drugs or analyze my dreams to help me? But I have to tell him, no, I can't, because that's not what I do. I help people change their behavior. But his problem is one that I think a lot of us can relate to. The problem of, you know, how do we stick to things? And I know I, a few years ago, I planned by the end of the summer, I planned to learn basics of speaking Chinese. But at the end of the summer, all I could say was, yeah, I'll have the Kung Pao chicken, please. <laughs> now, now, problems like this are, are not just about personal behaviors, like wanting to learn a new language or, or stick with things. They also apply to business. So 
A team in your organization may have plans to complete work by a deadline, but, but then they keep missing their deadlines. But they plan their own deadlines. <laughs> now, the, the typical solution to things like this, or, or the reasoning behind it is to say that the person is flawed, that the person doesn't have enough willpower, the person isn't motivated enough, and we need to change the person. But that only, you know, it not only makes us feel badly about ourselves as people with, with putting blame like that, but it's not the correct science. So, so what I've learned is that we just need to know that there are three different types of behaviors. Once we know those three different types of behaviors, there are a set of tools for changing those three types of behaviors. So that's what we're going to go over in this talk. Now, when you walked in, you should have received a, a card, hopefully. Raise your hand right now if you didn't get a, if you didn't get a card, and, and we can get someone to, to get your card right now. Great. Thanks so much. Uh, so on the card, I want to ask you to write down a behavior that you want to change. This can be a, a personal behavior, like getting yourself to read more books or, or to be more engaged in work. Um, it can be a, a business type behavior, like getting your employees to take better care of their health. Make sure to write it down, because toward the end, I'm going to call on some of you to talk about your behavior. And we'll call someone up here, actually. All right. How many of you have had the situation where you are trying to get something out, you're trying to talk, and someone keeps interrupting you? I think probably all of us have, yep, all of us have experienced that. Now, how many of you get frustrated when you're, when you're trying to talk and the person keeps frustrating you? Well, it may not be that person's fault. So that person may be doing what I call an automatic behavior. So an automatic behavior is something where we're not even aware of what we're doing. It just happens unconsciously. And knowing that something is an automatic behavior allows us to know how to address it. So other examples of an automatic behavior are forgetting that we're not standing up straight, eating food that's just sitting in front of us without even being aware of what we're doing. Those are automatic behaviors. But once we know that something's an automatic behavior, there are a set of tools and strategies that we can use to change it. But before we get into that, let's talk about the second type of behavior. So while, while waiting at a, a stoplight to cross the street, I'd often pull out my phone, check email to burn some time. And sometimes I'd even cross the street while I'm still reading the email. That's not always the best idea. It can lead to accidents. It can lead me tripping in the middle of the street. I shouldn't be doing that. But, but I feel like I wasn't able to stop. You know, I, I felt like I had to just finish reading this email, and then I'd put the phone away. So this is an example of what I call a burning behavior. Burning behaviors, while automatic behaviors are things that happen unconsciously, automatically, burning behaviors are behaviors where we're aware of what we're doing, but we feel powerless to stop. We feel like we just can't stop. So in my case, knowing that it was a burning behavior, I was able to stop it. And part of that solution comes from every week now, I take a digital day of rest. So from Friday to Saturday, I don't use any apps. I don't check email. I don't even talk about work. It's just time for friends and family. And I was able to, to address that and to, to stop what could be a growing digital addiction because I knew this was a burning behavior. But before we get into that, let me tell you about the last type of behavior. And I'll also go into, with this, the, the background of how I came to study this. So this is my brother up here. And when I was in, in graduate school, just 
down the street here at Stanford, my brother came up to visit. Now, he had been suffering from an intestinal disorder called Crohn's disease. And he came up to visit, and he was just in too much pain to go back home. So we brought him to the emergency room, and they looked at him, and it turns out his intestines had burst. So he was rushed into emergency surgery, and they saved his life. He was minutes away from dying, they said. They saved his life. So he spent, spent two weeks recovering at Stanford Hospital. Then he was prescribed daily medication, advised to change his lifestyle, and, uh, and then he was released. Now, now, try to put yourself in my brother's situation the way that I did. You just, you just almost died, and you've been told, change your lifestyle. Now, how likely do you, do you guys think you would be to do that? I mean, if you're like my brother, if you're like most people, you'd say, I'm going to change. I'm going to eat differently. I'm going to exercise. I'm going to take my medication. I'm going to do everything that I'm supposed to do. And my brother said he'd do that 100%, but he didn't. I didn't understand why. I, my family and I were really close. I love my brother. So I was on the phone with my mom for hours every day. And we were trying to figure out, you know, what could we do to get him to follow these recommendations. Why wasn't he doing it? I was scared for him. I was, I was worried. I was confused. And I was frustrated. And so I started searching for answers. I started talking to all different types of people, experts in education, in medicine, in business. And I was trying to find answers. But I kept finding, I kept finding the same one-size-fits-all solution answers. People were saying he needed to have more willpower. People were saying he needed to be more educated about Crohn's and how to change it. They were saying that, that he wasn't motivated enough about his health. But, this, but he's, my brother, smart. He's motivated. He's health conscious. He's educated. So these answers didn't make sense to me. And so that's why I started studying this area. And after 15 years of studying it, I've come up with some answers. So what I figured out is it's not about a one-size-fits-all solution, and it's not about blaming the individual. What we need to know is that not all behaviors are the same. There are three types of behaviors. You know, I found while I was questioning my brother's, while I was questioning why my brother wasn't changing, other things were happening at the same time in my life. I was in a band and, and trying to figure out how do we get how do we get the fans of our band to keep coming back to our shows, to keep buying albums? Uh, I was teaching classes at Stanford and wondering, why was it that the students in our classes would wait until the day a paper was due, and then they'd ask for more time? Or, or I was wondering, how could I get myself, where I was working on so many different things, to stay engaged and motivated in, in doing all of them? Now, all these seem like really different things, but on this, if you look deeper, they're, they're actually united by one common thread. And that's, how do we get people to stick with things? So people often, often were even planning what they were going to do, but they still kept failing. So how do we get people to stick with things? Well, what I found is that we need to know the three types of behaviors. So the three types of behaviors are Automatic burning and common behaviors, or what I call the ABCs of behavior. So I'll do a quick recap about that. Automatic behaviors are behaviors that happen unconsciously, like the example of the, the interrupter. Burning behaviors. Burning behaviors are, are behaviors that, that are not happening unconsciously, but we feel powerless to stop. Addictions are often burning behaviors. And then third are common behaviors. Common behaviors are the most common of all behaviors. Common behaviors are often due to motivation. 
So a common behavior is something where we're aware of what we're doing, but the, the risks of doing it or the energy that it takes for us to do it isn't worth the benefits we think we might get from doing it. So let me, let me say that again. I'll repeat that. Common behavior is something where the energy that it takes for us to do something or the, the risks that it takes for us to do it isn't worth the benefit we think we might get from doing it. So let me give an example because that's, that's a lot. So my brother's, my brother's lifestyle change was an example of a common behavior. Because despite being told that he should change his lifestyle and that may keep him out of the hospital, he didn't think it was worth it to change. Why should he, why should he give up things that he loved doing? Why should he change the way he eats? Why should he exercise more, meditate, take medication? Why should he do these things if there wasn't even a guarantee that it would work. That's a common behavior. But knowing that something is a common behavior, or an A or B behavior, allows us to know how to fix it. We just need to know the set of tools for fixing those types of behaviors. So the set of tools are what I call the forces of behavior change. Now, you guys, you guys have may have learned in physics that there are forces that move objects, that move objects, can't move this. <laughs> there are forces that move objects in certain directions. Well, there are behavioral forces that move people. They, they get us to behave in certain ways. Now, just as a flight crew or a pilot or aerospace engineers need to know the physical forces that move a plane in order to fly it safely. All of us need to know the behavioral forces that move people so we can behave the way we want. There are seven of these forces. So what I did, I came up with a framework called science where each one of these, each one of the letters of science represents a different one of the seven forces. And it's called science because it's not because you need a scientist to, to know it, but because it's based on decades of scientific research. So S stands for step ladders. We know we're supposed to do things in small steps, but we often don't. We often don't plan small steps to change our behavior. A few weeks ago, I, I ran into someone at the market, and he was a cross-country runner in high school and he decided that he wanted to run a marathon. He ran cross country in high school, so he knew how to run, but he hadn't run since then. You know, it had been 20 years since then, and he decides, I'm just gonna go run this marathon, and I'm gonna do it. I've got, I've got the motivation, I've got the energy, I can do this. And he actually did pretty well. <laughs> he got to mile 19, but then he collapsed. And he said, I didn't finish that marathon, and I'm probably not gonna run another marathon again. Now that story, you know, I don't know about for you guys, but there's no way I could run a marathon without training for it. So, so this makes a lot of sense. If we want to be able to do something, if we want to stick to things, we need to start in small incremental steps. But just like the marathon example, we often make the same mistakes in our own life. If we want to be able to if make a New Year's resolution to go to the gym, we'll say, I'm gonna to go to the gym. I, I haven't really been at all before this past year, but I'm gonna go five days a week for the next year. And that's a pretty tall order. So we need to think about things in small steps. But the question is, how do you know what a small step is? How do you know how small a step should be? So I created this, this figure here called Steps, Goals, and Dreams. Now the idea is, the marathon example, if, if I was gonna to try to run a marathon, I've never run one before, I'm not gonna be able to do it in a week. I'm not gonna be able to do it in a month, probably. It'd probably take me a few months of training to run a marathon. So that's what I call a dream. It's attainable, but it, it takes some time to get there. If I want something now to do, a first step would be something that takes less than a week. So, 
getting a pair of running shoes may be a, a first step. Or if I haven't run before much, running for 10, 15, 20 minutes. Just something small would be a first step. So this, this figure will teach us how we can plan steps that are the right size so that we don't give up. So that's step ladders. C stands for community. We all want to be different from the crowd. We want to be different than other individuals, but our social environment matters. It matters a lot more than we even think it does. And there's a science how to leverage social to create change. One of the, the studies that we do in our research, I, I created what's called the Hope Intervention. Hope Intervention is an online community where it's designed to motivate people to change their behavior. We invite people to a 12-week intervention, and we have found that these interventions to change people's behavior across different areas, drug use, HIV, different types of behaviors, we find that within 12 weeks, we can get people to change their behavior. And it leverages the, the force of community through these online communities. We find that, that people in our HOPE interventions are about two to three times as likely to change their behavior. Now, I stands for important. People won't do things unless they want to do it, unless they're motivated, right? Well, yes, but no, not necessarily. Motivation definitely matters, and that's why it's up here as one of these seven forces. But people actually don't need to be motivated in order to stick with things. So I'll give an example from the, the hope intervention that I was mentioning. We did, we did a hope intervention on trying to get people at high risk for HIV to get an HIV test. They weren't interested in, in getting an HIV test. We, just, we had them sign up for, a, in, for our group. They took a survey. We paid them to take a survey. And then we said, all right, you guys are free to go. You don't need to be in this community anymore. It was up to us to keep them engaged, keep them motivated. Well, by the end of the study, we had people in, in our HOPE group were much more likely, two to three times as likely as people who weren't, to test for HIV. They still didn't even, wasn't, weren't interested necessarily in testing, but we got them to test. So the point is, important and motivation matters, but if we're using the other forces, we can often get people to do things even if they're not motivated to do that thing themselves. <coughs> now, E stands for easy. If we can make something easier for people to do than for them not to do it, or easier for ourselves to do than to not do, people will do it. It's that simple. Just like, like uh, we, can, we can get people to, to do easy things by changing around our environment, we can do that with behaviors. In this chapter on easy, I talk about some business examples of how businesses were able to make things easy. So have you guys, who's heard the, the story of Joe Columby? So if you guys ask someone, ask someone about the story of, it's a, let's see, what's, what, uh, what time is it? Oh, we've got, okay, we've got time. Let me tell you this story. It's a good story. So Joe Columby, and uh, this was, took place in 1958, in the late 1950s. He had graduated from Stanford School of Business, from the GSB, and he went to go work for a company called Owl Rexall. Owl Rexall was a, a, a grocery chain, grocery store chain. And what they told him is, hey, Joe, we want you to go off on your own and start this new chain of stores called Pronto. So he starts Pronto, but Pronto was struggling. He wasn't doing well. The reason is there was this other competitor grocery store that had just come out, and they were doing really well. They were called 7-Eleven. So 7-Eleven was open at unprecedented hours. They were open 7 a.m. to 11 p.m. They were offering all kinds of products. Joe and Pronto couldn't compete. So Al Rexall said, it's not working. Let's ax Pronto, and, and we'll, we'll do something else, Joe. But 
Joe didn't want to do that. He left, he left work for Malorexol and he mortgaged his house and decides he's going to go on his own and save Pronto. But he didn't know how to do it. So, so he says, OK, I'm going to take a vacation meanwhile. I'm going to go to the Caribbean and, and think this over. And while he's in the Caribbean, he's relaxing. He's laying by the beach. People are bringing him Mai Tais. He's, he's drinking. They're bringing him food. He's listening to calypso and reggae music there. And he realizes this is a pretty sweet setup for someone who's on vacation. They're making it pretty easy for tourists to be here. Maybe there's something that I can do with this, this lifestyle, with this making it easy, and I can bring this back to Pronto. So that's what he does. So he goes back home, and, and compared to competitor stores, which were offering 10 different types of mayonnaise, 13 types of bread, you know, a ton of different product choices, Joe decides, I'm going to have just one. I'm going to make it easy for people when they come in here. They're going to know what they can purchase. And it worked. It worked. People started not only coming in to, to his stores, but they kept on buying, and it kept on working. And, and Pronto Stores, which ultimately changed their name, became a huge lasting success. They're still around today. Anyone know? Anyone have an idea of what the store chain is? You got it? Say it louder. Trader Joe's, exactly. So his name was Joe. They're inspired by the trip to the Caribbean. So now when you, you see the Hawaiian shirts, it's from the story of Joe. Now, Trader Joe's isn't the only one to leverage this force of easy. Think about Amazon. You know, Amazon Prime, Amazon Dash. Make shopping easy. You don't even lead, you don't have to leave your home. I mean, we I don't go shopping anywhere anymore, just everything on Amazon. They'll, they can deliver to you before you even know what you want to order. That's pretty easy. Google, you guys have actually done it too. And, and with some of you in the group, you may, be, uh, may have been involved in this. So, so Google, as you guys know, um, one of the founding tenets, one of the benefits of Google is that there's food everywhere. Well, that also can lead to the Google 15 or Google 20, right? And so Google found that their employees were not as healthy as they would like. So they decided, we're going to change around the dining halls and make it so that we're going to take the unhealthier foods and put it in the back and make them in containers that aren't clear anymore. Had a big effect on employee behavior and on health and on eating. So, the force of easy is, is a powerful way to change people's behavior. Next, N stands for neurohacks. Neurohacks are quick mental shortcuts that can get us to change our behavior. So just like hitting Control-Alt-Delete on a PC can allow us to use a program that was jammed up or reset things, neurohacks allow us to reset our brain and allow us to to think and behave in ways that we couldn't before. I'll give an example of a neurohack. In, in the chapter on neurohacks, I mention a story by a man named Mauricio. So Mauricio was, was a designer, and he was in a funk, though. He had just gotten a divorce. He didn't feel like motivated to be a designer anymore. He didn't feel like going to work, but he didn't know what to do. But he got an idea while he was at work one day, and he came across the familiar screen of, of it's flashing in front of him saying, you need to change your password. And he says, I'm going to use my password to change my life and get me out of this funk. So what does he do? So he says, I'm going to change my password to the number four, get her, forget her. Forget her. So, uh, or sorry, not for, forgive her. <laughs> Forgive her, forgive her, and forget. So forgive her. So he decides, I'm going to every day I have to type forgive her, and that will get me to be able to forgive, forgive for what's happened. And when he first started doing it, it was pretty difficult. You know, you can imagine he's going through this divorce, he's having a tough time, and now he has to type forgive her. So the first few times it was difficult, but what he found is that as he kept typing forgive her, it became easier to do. He didn't have these, these 
terrible feelings that he thought he would. He didn't have to change his password to something else. He could continue doing this. And it just reset his brain and made him think, I'm getting over her. I am, I'm forgiving her. I'm forgetting and I'm moving on. And he has moved on since. That was, it was a neurohack that allowed him to, to move on. But, but he didn't just stop there. He also, he was smoking and he, he changed his password to quit smoking. And he said, he told me that he quit smoking overnight. Five years later, he hasn't been smoking since. That's the power of neurohacks. C stands for captivating. We know that we should reward ourselves, we should reward people for, for doing things in order to, to create lasting change. But rewards don't always work. Think about the gamification, gamification fad, which has kind of fizzled out. So rewards work, but not always, because not all types of rewards work. Not everyone's motivated by points and badges and leaderboards. Now, we need not just any reward, but we need a reward that's truly captivating. It's got to be important to people. Different things are motivating to different people. So this chapter will talk about the history, and there's a long history going back about 100 years of, of how to motivate change and how to create rewards. This chapter will talk about it. Finally, E stands for ingrained. Now, Barack Obama was known for, for making a routine out of the clothes that he wore, the food that he ate, so that he could save time for making important decisions about our country. Mark Zuckerberg, he was known for, or he has uh, 20 versions of the same shirt. Writer Ernest Hemingway, he writes, he was known for writing every day at the same time in the morning. If you make something a routine, it becomes easier to do and it gets ingrained in our brain. So those are, those are the seven forces. That's the, the science framework. And now all we need to do is, is know, now that we know the, the ABCs, we know the three types of behaviors and we know the seven forces, we just need to know which of the seven forces do we use and when? So I created a, a simple two-step model. It's pretty easy. You just step one, identify whether something is in A, B, or C behavior. And second, apply the forces needed to change that type of behavior. So this is, this is what I call the science of lasting change. And here's, here's the figure. You can see that first there's automatic behaviors, burning behaviors, and common behaviors. Automatic behaviors, we're not aware of what we're doing. So there's, there's no brain in the stick figure's head. Burning behaviors, we're, we're a little bit more aware. Um, and then common behaviors, we're fully aware. So, and, and as you can see, the, the seven forces are listed down at the bottom. And the more stars next to that force, the more important it is for changing that type of behavior. You know, in general, as we get more complicated types of behaviors, as we get more aware of it, we need a larger set of tools to change those types of behaviors. We need more forces. Now, this, this framework is something that I've put together based on decades of scientific research from other scientists and psychologists and from our own work. I found that this works across a number of different areas. We've, we've used it, I'm in the medical school, and we've used it and applied to people at risk for diseases where we need to change health. I found that it works in my own life for personal behaviors, and, and it works in business work that I do too. So, so this gives you a high-level overview, and, and if there's, there's more questions, the, the book goes into a lot more detail about this framework. And what I want to do now, the, the purpose of this talk, I want to leave you guys with understanding the difference between A, B, and C behaviors. 
So what I'd like to do now as a, a type of Q&A is have someone come up here uh, and we'll talk about whether your behavior is an A, B, or C behavior. But, but first, let's everyone pull out your cards that, that we had at the beginning and raise your hand if you wrote down an A behavior. OK, raise your hand if you wrote down a, a B behavior. I think so. Half, we have hands halfway. Yeah, I think so. Good. Good. What are, what's, what's the B behavior? <coughs> Coughing. Uh, brushing the teeth at lunchtime. Brushing the teeth at lunchtime. OK. And, uh, and C behavior. Great. So what's the, what's the C behavior you had? Making music, excellent. That's one after my own heart. Um, all right, so so let's let's uh, just to to settle it in and, and make sure we understand the difference. Let's call call someone up. Can I get a, a brave volunteer to, to come up here and walk through it? All right, thanks for coming up here, Chris. Sure. So tell us about tell us about your behavior. Your well, be I'm really into dark chocolate, and um, unfortunately, I'm into it in at nighttime. And the darker, the better. So I tend to eat it before I go to bed, and then I fall asleep until 3 o'clock, and then I'm like, I'm up. So it's a pretty common behavior, but sometimes it feels burning, like I just have to have it. Because I get a lift. Sometimes I can get a little work done. Excellent. So you're already, you're already thinking about it. So here's a, here's a chart I was going to ask. Do we think it's a, an A, B, or C behavior? So if it's done without awareness, so the behavior he mentioned was you know, late night snacks and eating chocolate at, at nighttime. If it's done without awareness, I mean, my guess, I'm with you, my guess is that it's a, a C behavior, but let's, let's just go through, for example. So it would be an A behavior if you're not even aware, you're, you're almost either sleepwalking or you're just going in there grabbing chocolate. Um, it sounds like you're you're aware of what you're doing. When oh, you're, I always know what I'm doing. You know what you're, you want that chocolate. <laughs> yeah. Don't keep me away from the chocolate. Yeah. Um, it would be a B behavior. Is it, does it feel almost like an addiction? Does it feel like you can't stop yourself? Um, when I'm really stressed out, it feels like I can't stop myself. When you're really, when you're really stressed out, you can't do it. OK. And, and in general, in general, it's, uh, it's something where you're aware of what you're doing, but it's just there are other things that are that are, you know, it's driving you toward it. You're, you're aware of what you're doing, but you really want the chocolate and, and feel like you should eat it. Well, it, it tastes good, and I get a lift. Mm -hmm. So good. I would, I would call that a common behavior, too. But it's, it's a, this is a good example, because some behaviors based on the person or based on the behavior, it can be in different categories. And we're, we'll use different solutions to address it. So, so let's talk about how to address it. Let's go back to go back to here. So as you'll see, common behaviors, community has three stars. So that makes it really important if we can, if we can include community, that'll help out a lot. So the question is, do you live with anyone? I do. You do, OK. Yeah. Uh, so does the, the person who you live with, do they, do they also eat chocolate? She eats a lot of sugar at night, so. <laughs> um, so I, I, I feel like I'm a little more disciplined than she is, but she doesn't have any issues with it. You know, She can just have her sweet stuff, and she'll go to sleep. But. So that's, you guys see the, the challenge that's, that's confronted? That's one of the difficult parts. You know, If you're living with someone, um, and that person has no problem with the behavior that they're doing and you have a problem when you're doing it, it can make it difficult. So, you know, so one, this is where, where uh, discussions come in and, and would, she be, would she be willing to change? Would she be willing, could you have this discussion with her where both of you guys could, could uh, slow down or stop eating late night chocolate? And if not, it's fine. If the answer is no, we can, but that's a, a first solution. Well, yeah, I mean, she tends to stay up later and watch TV, so we could have hours <laughs> mm -hmm. where she eats her stuff and I eat mine. <laughs> Got it. OK. So it sounds like, so that's, that's a more difficult one. Um, but, but what we can do is, so 
Easy is very important. Uh, is there a way for you to be able, it sounds like sheets or sweets, but for you it's chocolate. Is there a way for you to either just get the chocolate out of the house, not have chocolate around? Well, I've, I've moved it out of the office and into the pantry. So I, I have to go downstairs to, to do it. So Excellent. it's further away. Excellent. So, so that's an example of, of being able, if it's further away, then it's going to be harder to do. It's not going to be as easy, and, and you'll be less likely to do it. And has that, ha, how's that worked out for you? It's lessened the intake. Great. <laughs> so the next step would be, can you get it out of the house completely? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to do that. Uh, yeah. I, don't want to I don't really want to, but um, I can for periods of time. And then I feel like I have to sort of just re <laughs> I just have to have some. So, so if, you can, I, if yeah. you can make it where you have to go to the store, in order to get the chocolate, that'll, that'll lessen the amount of, of chocolate that you're eating. That's a, a simple one that definitely makes it easy. Um, there, also, if you could put, are there other kinds of foods that you would like that you can put other than chocolate, you can make closer to you. So when you're sitting around watching TV, can you put food in front of you other than chocolate that yeah. you would eat and would just fill you up? Yeah, I, I like fruit, and that won't, that won't keep you away. Great, great. Yeah. So, so that's an, another example of, of how we can use Easy. We can do this in a, in a gradual process, like don't just necessarily throw all the chocolate out of the house if you don't think that'll work, but you can start with just putting fruit in front of you and eating the fruit or other food. Um, and what you'll find is that as that becomes a routine, it'll become ingrained, ingrained in your brain. Every day you'll start doing it. And it'll become a neuro hack. So you might think I'm not capable of stopping myself from eating chocolate, but as you see, day after day that you're eating fruit instead, you'll realize there's nothing wrong with me. It's not like I'm just wired to have to have this chocolate, um, but you're capable of doing it. And it will reset your brain and reset your behavior. So, so these, are, these are the ways of, of incorporating the, the science of lasting change. And, and uh, just this is a, a, quick, a quick example of a, of a stick with it session. So let's all, let's all give Chris a hand for, for coming up here, being brave for doing that. Thank Thanks you. so much, Thank Chris. You. All right, now, now before, we, before we end off, I'm, after all, I'm a, a teacher, so I can't have you guys leave here without giving you an assignment. Now. Just by, just for showing up here today, you guys are, have already activated some of the important, important forces for lasting change and, and being able to change the behavior that you wrote down. And what we want to do is, is keep that energy going, keep, keep the motivation going, and, and keep, keep the forces. So, so with this take, -home, this take home assignment, this is something to do immediately, to do today. What I want you to do is, Take the behavior that you wrote down on the card, and I want you to, to tell someone else. You could tell, could be a coworker, could be a friend, could be a romantic partner, could be a stranger. I want you to tell them, do you think the behavior is a, a B, or C behavior, and why? Why do you think that? And just by going through this process of discussing it with them, it helps to reinforce in your head. It, it will teach you to how to, to know the difference, and will Keep the energy going. Second, I, please email me and let me know. You can reach me at seanyoungphd.com or on Twitter at seanyoungphd. Tell me whether you think it's in A, B, or C behavior and why. Now, I went into this, this area because I really wanted to, to be able to have an impact on the world and to help people. So, so please reach out to me. I really want to, to be able to try to help with this. Now, before I, before I finish off, I have good news to share going back to the story of my brother. He, in the years since then, my brother has, he's changed his behavior. He 
really healthy eating. He exercises. He takes his medication. He does everything that he's supposed to do. And best of all, he's really healthy. He's, he's been feeling great, and he's been doing really well. And since he's my brother, I can pretend to take some credit for that. So I'm going to leave you guys. And, and if, if the information in here, if this was helpful, if you like this, hopefully, it, hopefully you learned something and enjoyed it. If you did, there's this great book out here that you guys can all read that will give you more info about it. You're laughing at this picture. My favorite, uh, I think my favorite thing about this picture is that it makes me wonder the other photographer was a cat wearing a GoPro. <laughs> this quote at the top, we, we often, when we're trying to do things, we think that if we can't do it, it's because we're not motivated enough, because we're not inspired. We don't have enough willpower. But those are temporary feelings. They come and they go. So we can't have behaviors last just based on inspiration. What we need is to have a process that doesn't matter how we're feeling at the time, we'll be able to follow that process. So that's where I say motivation, inspiration, and willpower are temporary feelings. The secret to sticking with something is to use a process that you can follow no matter how you feel. You guys have been a great audience. Thank you so much for inviting me here. And I look forward to hearing from you later today.